Well, gentlemen, welcome to Men's Theology Forum of the Eastern Panhandle. It is great to see some of you again. We're missing some folks tonight, but the cool thing is we are still recording the, the uh, talks on video. So we have uh, the distinct pleasure of having uh, a guy who's been teaching a long time <laughs> with us tonight, Mike uh, Stell. Mike is a Ph.D. candidate at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., majoring in systematic and historical theology. He also is a graduate of Clark Summit University and Reformed Theology Seminary. His research focuses on the 19th century uh, America and the Reformation period and apologetics and political theology. Our next, uh, the, the, the forum tonight, um, this month, we're happy to welcome Mike uh, to speak about the Reformed theologian John Williamson Nevin. And uh, some of you may be aware of who that is, uh, but interestingly enough, and I'm probably stealing a bit of Mike's talk, but he grew up, or at least he lived most of his life uh, as a theologian right up the street from us. Mike, I'm sure, knows much more about that, but um, here in Pennsylvania. And, um, and Mike has also been, uh, a, a, is also currently teaching at a classical Christian school called Redeemer Classical Christian School in Kingsville, Maryland, just north of Baltimore, and um, has previously been a principal of three Christian schools as well. So he's, uh, he's been a teacher for quite some time. What he's doing tonight will not be too new, maybe just the subject matter. So look forward to hearing from Mike. He also, I should mention, I just found out, his uh, doctoral dissertation that he's working on right now is actually on John Williamson Nevin, the guy that we're going to be hearing a bit about tonight. Uh, though I'm not sure he's going to be focusing on that specific aspect of uh, his uh, dissertation. So look forward to having Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. All right. Well, it's good to be here this evening. And... Uh, <clears throat> I'll probably be, um, just preface, being a teacher, I normally don't just talk, right? I mean, so I like interaction. So um, if I say something that's like, wait, what? Um, feel free to interrupt me. That doesn't bother me um, in any way if you, if you have some just generalized informational questions as we go through. Um, feel free to say something. So. What I kind of want to do here this evening is just a little bit of an intro to uh, John Nevin um, and uh, a couple of key elements of his thought. And then uh, as Peter and I were talking, um, I, I'll kind of end with um, some ways that Nevin has helped me think through some issues. So um, I could probably spend a lot of time on any one particular aspect of that. But uh, I don't want to uh, spend too much time uh, on any one thing. So, um, so uh, just give some uh, basic bio, biographical info on Nevin. Um, so he was born in 1803. He died in 1886. Uh, incidentally, he died the year that Karl Barth was born. So if you want to f talk about parallels between theologians and days they were born, that might be an interesting one. Um, he was born in Franklin County, Pennsylvania. Um, he was of Scotch-Irish background. So um, he looks Scotch-Irish. If you've ever seen a picture of him, he looks tall and thin and stern. Um, and typical of the Scotch-Irish, I don't know that he ever smiled. Um, <laughs> at least we have no documented evidence of smiles. Um, he was baptized in Middle Spring Presbyterian Church in Shippensburg, PA. Um, he was largely homeschooled. So uh, for those of you who are homeschoolers, uh, he was a homeschooler. Um, his father was a graduate of uh, Dickinson College in uh, PA. And uh, he records the fact that he learned his Latin lessons uh, while he was out doing his chores in the barn and things along those lines. So uh, he's a kind of an interesting character. He went to college at 14, uh, which wasn't too unusual for the time period. Uh, Jonathan Edwards went to uh, Yale when he was 13. Um, so he went to college at 14, uh, Union College in Schenectady, Pennsylvania. 
It was called Union College because it was a joint venture between the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians. Um, so uh, after graduating from college, uh, he was psychologically and physically kind of uh, undone. Uh, I'll get into maybe a little bit of that, but he spent two years recovering from his college life. Um, if you can imagine a 14-year-old going to college, they probably aren't emotionally ready. He probably wasn't emotionally ready, but he was very smart, so he, uh, he went off to college. So after two years at home re recuperating, he went to Princeton, um, studied under the uh, stalwarts of Princeton Theological Seminary, um, particularly the young Charles Hodge, who was just newly <coughs> starting out there. And uh, he was a good student there, and he was particularly good at languages. And so when Hodge took a two-year sabbatical to go to Germany to finish his studies, Nevin filled in for him um, for during those two years. Uh, after his two years teaching at Princeton, he went to uh, Western Seminary, which at that time was in the wild and woolly west of Pittsburgh. Um, we don't tend to think about Pittsburgh as the wild west um, but at that time, there wasn't as much going on in Pittsburgh as there is now. He uh, taught at Western Seminary from 1830 to 1840. And uh, at the end of that time, he uh, received a call to go to the German Reform Seminary at Mercersburg. And uh, it is while he is at Mercersburg that he uh, had his most prolific writing career. Um, he wrote an immense amount of material in a relatively short period of time. It's, uh, it's almost boggling from 1840, really 1844, um, until 1853. Um, he published an immense amount of material. Um, so that while he was teaching, while he was the president of the, the seminary and the college, uh, that was there. Um, he just did an immense amount in that 13-year uh, period. As you can imagine, after 13 years of that amount of work um, and uh, all the other stuff that goes along with running the school, um, he was wiped out. And uh, he, uh, when Marshall College merged with Franklin College and moved to Lancaster, PA, he resigned and was planning on going into retirement. Um, after a few years, he uh, was brought back. He taught at Franklin and Marshall for a while. He was president of Franklin and Marshall for about 10 years, uh, the 1860s. And um, he finally retired in 1877, um, just nine years before he died. Uh, I don't know if this is good or bad. He was friends with James Buchanan. Um, James Buchanan <laughs> is considered by many to be the worst president the United States has ever had. Um, but nonetheless, they were good friends. They lived uh, near one another in Lancaster. Um, and uh, Nevin is buried in the main cemetery in downtown Lancaster. Um, so if you want to, you can go, go visit his grave. Um, the uh, interesting thing with Nevin, as I have mentioned, he was born and raised a Presbyterian, um, but he is most well known for his work as a German Reformed theologian. And that is important because he moves away from Presbyterianism and uh, becomes much more involved in German theology, um, basically from the mid-1830s um, through the end of his life. And uh, so he goes through a period of transformation, I guess you could say, theologically. Um, because he is reading uh, German, um, German theologians. Um, and so he is very definitely influenced by some of the things that are going on. And this comes across in a couple of key areas uh, in his theology, which I want to focus on um, uh, this evening. So uh, two big things that uh, he is really well known for. Um, both for good and for ill, and that is his doctrine of the incarnation and his doctrine of the church. 
And so I'll focus uh, just a little bit from an introductory standpoint on those two aspects. Um, and then I'll end with, well, all right, what, what did Nevin do for me? Um, I'll just maybe uh, um, pause and give a plug. Um, his most famous book um, is The Mystical Presence, um, and this is the Mercersburg Theological Study Series version of this. Um, there are planned, I think, 14 volumes in the series. Um, I'm editing one of them on his uh, historical writings. Um, so, um, but this is the Mystical Presence. Uh, if you only buy one book and read one book of his, this is the book everyone buys and reads, uh, because it is his most important. Um, this is the same book, only first edition, so this is what it looked like when oh, it was wow. published. <laughs> this is the critical edition with all of the explanatory footnotes, including the Latin <laughs> translations, because how uh, many of us really have Latin is good enough to, uh, to do that. So, um, so... Um, so in 1846, he publishes The Mystical Presence, and uh, two years later, Charles Hodge reviews the book and does not have anything good to say about the book, and, or his former student. And this leads to a intellectual battle between the two of them over a number of issues, um, but the two big ones are Nevin's influence by German theology in his Doctrine of the Incarnation and Nevin's view of the church, um, both of which Hodge thinks uh, Nevin has left behind um, uh, Orthodox Reformed theology. Um, so at various times in Nevin's writings, he will uh, talk about orthodoxy, um, but Nevin doesn't mean orthodoxy in the sense of the larger doctrines of the Christian church. He means Hodge's Presbyterianism. So whenever he talks about Puritanism or Orthodoxy, he has Hodge in mind. That's kind of the person he's, he's always going after. So I'll talk a little bit about um, Nevin's Doctrine of the Incarnation and Nevin's Doctrine of the Church. And uh, these two things are um, deeply connected, so you can't talk about one without the other. Um, for Nevin, his Doctrine of the Incarnation uh, really boils down to two ideas that at, uh, is kind of always in his mind when he thinks about this. So they are that uh, the Incarnation needs to be understood in terms of a life, uh, the life of Christ that has a continuing reality in the world today. And secondly, that uh, the Incarnation should always be understood in terms of union. So these two things are kind of always what Nevin is talking about. So um, two, uh, two texts. Um, all of what I'm saying you can find in Mystical Presence, um, but I am looking at two texts that are specifically dealing with his doctrine of the Incarnation um, and uh, his doctrine of the Church. So um, we'll talk about, about those things. All right? So, uh, so let's jump in. Um, so uh, Nevin calls the Incarnation the Cardinal Doctrine of Mercersburg Theology. Um, if you want to understand Mercersburg Theology, you have to understand the Incarnation. This is where it all, uh, it all hinges on this. Um, his Doctrine of the Incarnation is trying to do justice to the Apostles' Creed. So Nevin says the true order of the Christian faith is given in the Creed. All rests on the mystery of the Incarnation. That is itself Christianity, the true idea of the gospel, the new world of grace and truth in which the discord of sin, the vanity of nature, the reign and death are brought forever to an end. The Incarnation. Um, the big thing for Nevin is he wants to avoid two extremes in the Incarnation. He First of all, um, he wants to avoid the, uh, the extreme of the ancient Gnosticism, right? And that is the idea that the Incarnation is just a mere apparition. That Christ didn't really become, uh, wasn't really born a man, but, right, but his human nature is kind of this apparition which exists around the real reality, which is the divine. 
The second thing that he wants to avoid in the incarnation is he wants to avoid what he thinks is more, um, more going on in the way that Presbyterians were thinking at the time. And that is that the incarnation exists only as the context for which the divine can suffer. So for Nevin, he wants to avoid these two, two extremes because this doesn't talk about the incarnation in terms of life. This just talks about incarnation as a context. And so Nevin always wants to come back to the issue of life. That the incarnation is the life of Christ in the world. Um, with the incarnation, something fundamental has happened in the history of the world. The incarnation changed everything. So this is a quote. He says, Here is an order of life which was not in the world before. The Word made flesh, God and man brought into living union in the person of Jesus Christ as the nucleus and fountain of salvation for the race. So God and mankind are united by the very constitution of his person in the incarnation. So Christ doesn't merely become a mediator. It is by this union of the divine and the human that, the, that uh, mediation can take place between God and man. So Christ accomplishes reconciliation and atonement, not through any understanding of his work seen outside of the union of God and man, but by the very nature of the union itself. So Nevin says the mission of salvation, which he came to fulfill, was not indeed at once completed by the mystery of the hypostatical union. His mediatorship involved a history, a work, the execution of prophetical, priestly, and kingly offices, a life of suffering and trial, the atonement, the resurrection, the sitting at the right hand of God, from which he shall come to judge the world, but all this only as proper and necessary result of the first mystery itself, the entrance of the divine word in a living way into the sphere of our fallen humanity. So for Nevin, he really wants to think in terms of the whole life of Christ, not simply Christ's um, Passion Week. Um, and what he thinks is taking place is that theology in America has, has become so focused on suffering and um, and the appeasement of God's wrath that it misses the larger reality of the incarnational reality of the life of Christ. And so he's constantly talking about this in terms of the entirety of the life of Christ. So what is the whole life of Christ that he wants to focus on, not simply this one particular week where Christ suffers? Christ's mediatorial work takes place through the entirety of Christ's life, from his birth all the way through his death resurrection and ascension. And so for Nevin, the ascension is key. Um, and he doesn't see that the ascension is really important in much of modern American theology. Um, and in this way, by focusing on the incarnation as the union of, of a life um, to the human uh, this means that the incarnation, this incarnational union is not temporary, but it is permanent. Um, and this leads him into the, one of the things that is probably most controversial about his doctrine of incarnation is that it, in the incarnation, uh, we have actually the salvation of humanity. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so Nevin talks about this idea that the incarnation is... Uh, in some way, redeeming of all human nature, not simply individual human beings. Um, so what I think uh, Nevin is talking about here is he wants to talk about this idea of, of being able to, um, to, to deal with human nature in such a way that human nature has to be elevated. And I'll talk more about this when I talk about... Um, about uh, Nevin's uh, influence on me. Um, and so what he wants to say here is that uh, what Nevin, or excuse me, what, uh, what, what the Incarnation has done is introduced 
into humanity, an organic reality that grows through human nature. Right? So all of humanity is comprised into two individuals, either Adam or Christ. And through this, we are either connected to one or the other, and it is through this connection that we grow in grace. Right? And so, so he has to think of, if we are going to talk about uh, the first Adam and the second Adam, right, that has to mean something. That has to be something more than simply a way of talking. This is two ways of, t of understanding the composition of the human race. So for Nevin, um, our individual salvation starts this way, right? It is this, um, this ingrowing of the incarnational reality, the life of Christ that comes into our lives. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave that at that. And uh, this leads Nevin to another part of his, let me skip ahead here, uh, his discussion, and that is um, his doctrine of union, um, the mystical union. So uh, Nevin talks about the incarnation and the mystical union. In this way, he says that the union is the participation of Christ's benefits. In the case of his people, it turns on a real communion with his human nature in the way of life. Right? So this is a real communion. This is a real participation, not simply an abstraction. And for Nevin, he's always talking about trying to get away from this idea of, of abstraction that these are just mental states. And he wants to get down into something that is more than that. So um, this, uh, this idea of the mystical union. Mike, yep. for clarification's sake, <clears throat> what you're saying, another way of saying that is, uh, just so I understand, is that um, typically we tend to think of our faith as something outside of us, mm -hmm. outside of nature, the things we see, the things we can touch, the things that happen around us, history and time. Right. Things like that. Is that what you mean? Like we tend to think about our faith as if... As a... So for Nevin, he wants to say, we tend to think about faith in terms of, of mental state, right? How do I know I believe? I just know that. Right? That's a mental state that doesn't mm -hmm. have any real participation. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, but, but so what he wants to say is rather that we, we have to think in terms of this union as this union with Christ as being something which is necessary for our salvation. It's not simply um, about um, whether we mentally know it, but that we are really truly, in fact, united with Christ. Um, and so, with this, um, with this union with Christ, uh, this union of the divine and the human. This leads us to this understanding of real continuing living grace that carries over into humanity. And how does this take place? This brings Nevin to his doctrine of the church, right? If the church is the body of Christ, um, we therefore can say that this body of Christ is um, continuing this living reality through the life of the church. Right? And so he wants to say, these things are interconnected. If the incarnation is a real union of the divine and the human, then we can talk about how does this, how does this body um, continue on in the mediatorial work that God has given Christ to do. It continues on in the life of the church. So in the life of the church, we want to think about this in terms of... Um, uh, Nevin uh, thinks about this in terms of the creed, right? So we have to think in terms of the way the Apostle Creed talks about, right? I believe in one holy Catholic Church. So for Nevin, his doctrine of the Church begins also from a perspective of faith. So for Nevin, and this again is controversial, for Nevin, the Church is an object of faith. It is not simply an aggregate um, composition of a bunch of people. The church is an object of faith. It is the mediatorial reality of Christ um, in our world. So Nevin, uh, we'll talk about this um, right uh, over and over again. 
the church is um, the church is an object of faith. Um, and he talks about this is where he'll get into some use of German idealism, but he'll talk about um, uh, all versus whole, and I won't get into all of this. But he does talk about ideal versus actual, and so for the church, the church always begins with the ideal, right? There's an idea, this idea is uh, the church as it exists in its reality after time ends, um, right? But this church has to find some physical manifestation in our world, and this is the actual church. So the church can't be simply ideal, it has to be actual. We have to have a church which exists in time and space, and this is the church that we talk about. This is the church that we interact with. This is the church that is um, striving for perfection, but does not yet achieve it. This is the church that we know. And this church has to have certain characteristics. <coughs> what are those characteristics? Right? It has to be one. It has to be Catholic. Right? It has to be these things. So Nevin actually talks about this in terms of... I'm going to find my spot here. In terms of four realities, um, Mike, can yep. I pause you real quick? Yep. So um, you may get that I haven't been getting to this. I don't know, but, but obviously you do not mean Roman Catholic necessarily, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's what I was just going to. Yeah. Do. Okay. So uh, it has to have four characteristics. It has to be visible. It has to be Catholic. It has to be historic. And it has to be life bearing. These are the four characteristics of the church, right? Visible, he just means we can't talk about the real church um, as simply uh, this abstraction it has to exist in real time and space, right? The church that we interact with in our lives has to in some way be connected to the ideal church. Um, Catholic, of course, we do not mean Roman Catholic. Um, he means the organic reality of the church that exists globally through the entirety of our space that we occupy, and also through history, right? There has to be some way for us to talk about a connection that exists between the church of ancient times, the church of the medieval period, the church of our time, that the church has this organic existing reality that encompasses the globe, and an organic existing reality that encompasses history. And this is Catholic. Um, it has to be historical, right? We have to talk about the church is always existing through history in the sense that we can't say that there was a time when the promise that Christ gave to us that the church would always be there. We can't say that that ceases to exist. So the church has to exist through history. And here is where he says something that is probably the most controversial, that the church of the Middle Ages gave birth to the Reformation. And this... Uh, causes uh, a tremendous amount of controversy as well. But I think for Nevin, and I think Nevin is right in this regard, um, I think this is an important reality for us to keep in mind. Right? That um, how can we talk about um, the church um, ending and starting? Right? We, we can't think about that. The church has to have this Catholicity in a historic sense that exists all through history. Yes. I have a question. So, <clears throat> I thought that you started off the segment saying that that according to Nevin, church is an object of faith, right? Correct. And so it's not it's 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 the the, the group like in in Protestant world you'd hear things like it's the 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 church is within the believers. Yeah, Nevin would say no. So to Nevin, church is very much an earthly institution. Correct. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the reason he would say no is perhaps the last one, and that is that the church has to be life-bearing, right? So the church is the existing mediatorial relationship that exists between Christ and his people. How do we grow in faith? We grow in faith through the ministrations of the church. So what does he mean then about the church as an object of faith? I, I guess I'm confused about that point. Uh, I think... I think, I think Nevin means that in the same way that we say in the Apostles' Creed that I believe in God the Father, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
So he's suggesting that we need to put our faith into an, insula- or an, an earthly institution? Is that what he's saying? Not necessarily in the earthly institution the way we tend to think about earthly institutions like political parties. But the earthly institution in the sense that it is the continuation of the life of Christ um, in real history. Right? The church is the body of Christ, and that body of Christ continues through history. So by putting my faith in the church, I am trusting the church to be the, the, the one who mediates Which to church? me. Well, let me, let me finish my thought, and then I'll come <laughs> okay, back to sorry. that. Yeah. Um, right, so the, the, church, um, the church will mediate to me the grace that Christ gives to me um, and will be the one who carries me through, right? I think that's what he means. Now that does lead to the question of, which church and how do you know um and this is the point where nevin um nevin has the most difficulty um he has the most difficulty personally because he looks around him and he sees protestantism as falling apart right and so in the 19th century protestantism is you know just splitting itself all over the place right so we think the 20th century as Protestant churches split all over the place. That begins in the 19th century, and Nevin is, um, sees this and sees this as problematic, right? So he will talk about pseudo-Protestantism, he'll talk about the Antichrist spirit, um, and this is all in reference to these groups which are splitting away from the church. So um, I, I do think in Nevin's thought, this is a problem. And I think Nevin recognizes it ultimately as a problem. For Nevin, uh, what he holds on to is the idea of, of organic historical change that takes place through time. So, so the church is not perfect, has never been perfect, but it is always moving toward perfection. So, so where, where do I go to find the true church? I, I can't find the true church because that's the ideal church. All churches that I interact with in a local sense have to in some way be connected to the true church but are not the true church. In Catholicism. Meaning mature or perf- perfect. Perfect. Right. Yes. And that's how the medieval church would give way to the Reformation. Correct. Right. The medieval church was corrupt. It needed to be changed. It needed to be reformed. But that Reformation was such that, um, right, that that can be overcome. That's an imperfection. That is not the church dying. And I think that's what Nevin wants to say. So this might be a little bit of a, of a, of a sidebar. And if it sure. is, tell me to be quiet and I'll be quiet. But can I, I, can I, I interrupt real quick before sure. I say anything? Just so everybody knows, we will have a time of Q&A later where yeah. we can elaborate on things. Okay, I'll but if you, if you if you have something that's pertaining to exactly what he's saying right now and you need clarification, go for it. I don't want to discourage No, you. I, I don't think it's going to clarify okay. what he's saying as go much on. as provide Question. a huge distraction. Yeah, sure. So I'll wait until <laughs> hold, But seriously, hold it. And we want to ha- entertain it. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I do think um, there's a sense in which you know, how does this work in Protestantism? Now, um, I do have a friend who wrote his dissertation on Nevin who said it doesn't. Nevin's theology, his, his ecclesiology, his doctrine of the church is ultimately unstable, and Protestants can't hold on to it. It's too Catholic. Um, I, I, I understand that point. I think, well, I think there is some, some things that I do want to hold on to from Nevin's ecclesiology. Um, right, so, um, I'm sorry, can you explain ecclesiology? Ecclesiology is doctrine of the church. Okay, thank you. All right, (laughs) so the last thing that Nevin wants to say, so we have visible, Catholic, historic, the last thing is life-bearing, and this is where I think Nevin gets into his doctrine of the, the sacraments. So what do the sacraments do for us? The sacraments mediate for us the reality of this ongoing presence of Christ in our lives, right? So how does Christ's mediatorial work take place? It is mediated to us through the church, through the sacraments. Um, How do I grow in grace? How do I grow in the life of the church? I grow in the life of the church through the sacraments. 
and this is the way that I interact with the uh, with the reality, the ongoing reality of the doctrine of the church. So, so why is the church necessary for Nevin? This is always the thing that he comes back to: why go to church? Um, and for Nevin, it has to be uh, because of this reality of this ongoing um, sacramental presence which exists in the church. Uh, without the sacraments, I cannot fully be a Christian. So for Nevin, it really is um, right the same thing that uh, Calvin will say, that uh, we can't call, and this is a quotation from Cyprian, we can't call God our father if we don't call the church our mother. And so for Calvin, this is, has to be a real reality uh, because otherwise we don't really need the church. Right? What distinguishes the church between a Sunday school class, a Bible study, and a political party? For Nevin, right, it has to be something. What is it? Right? It is this ongoing existing reality of the incarnate Christ which mediates his grace to us through the, through the ministry of the church. We are united to Christ as individuals through the ministry of the church. And this, for Nevin, is, uh, is key. All right. So, um, how did Nevin help me? Um, I could probably spend all my time talking about this. Um, so the big thing for me is I think about this in terms of what C.S. Lewis said in his um, his essay on why why should we read old books? Good. So uh, yeah, so C.S. Lewis and his on the reading of old books talks about the, uh, the reality that we have a difficult time uh, evaluating our own culture because it's the culture in which we live, right? So you, uh, you can't ask a fish what the water is like because the fish doesn't have any concept of what water is. This is just the environment in which we live. Hmm. So, um, so one of the things that I have found Nevin to be helpful is he he's a, lives in a different cultural reality than our own, and he can help uh, judge our own cultural reality. So I just think, why do we read old dead guys and girls? Um, because they help us evaluate our own culture. Where, where are our blind spots? Um, so, so for me, I'll start out with the two things. Uh, Nevin's helped me think through the doctrine of the incarnation in an entirely new way. Um, so the big thing, I think, for me is... Um, we, we tend to think about grace as a singular thing, right? That, that grace heals us. Um, but if you go back to the patristics and even the reformed scholastics, so this, these are the writers who write after the Reformation before the 18th century, they talk about two kinds of grace that humanity gets through Christ. Um, and so the first is healing grace, that we are broken and we need to be healed. And the second is elevating grace that there is something in us that has to be elevated beyond the existence that we have now. And I think about it this way. So, um, so grace is not simply restoring us to the pre-fall Adamic reality. Because Adam and Eve, um, although they were sinless, I don't think we can say that they were perfect. And the reason is, is because they have the potential to sin. And as long as they have the potential to sin, they can't exist truly in the presence of God because there's always that possibility that they, they might sin. And so what I think Nevin's doctrine of the Incarnation in its totality, and I've only been able to give you a small slice of it, what I think Nevin's doctrine of the Incarnation does is it gives us a way to think through, well, all right, what has to happen for humanity to live in the presence of God, which is really what we are destined for, right? Um, we are, we are destined for, this is um, a classic way, and one of the greatest theologians who talks about this is Jonathan Edwards, we are destined for the beatific vision, or the vision of God itself, where we can see God as he is, not mediated through Jesus and in the incarnation, not mediated um, the way Moses saw God, but God as he is in himself, as much as we can as human beings. So I think what Nevin has done is helped me think through the fact that in the Incarnation, 
there is something more than going on than just healing the human race, that the incarnation itself elevates the human race, that human nature itself is perfected beyond what even Adam and Eve were, right? That Christ as the God-man is the most fully human that a human can be, and this is what we will be. Mm. Um, so I think that's one thing that uh, Nevin has done um, well for me, is help me to just think through that, right? So what, what does uh, healing grace mean? What does elevating grace mean in light of the incarnational reality of the God-man? Um, so, so that's a big thing for me, right? I mean, I've done a lot of thinking on that. Um, and so this leads to a discussion in theology would, would Christ have been incarnated if Adam and Eve had never sinned? And the traditional answer you get is no, right? Because if the incarnation is just about fixing the problems that humanity has, then what do we need an incarnation for if Adam and Eve never sinned, if no human had never sinned? <coughs> and what I think Nevin does is he reminds us that two things have to take place, and that is that because we've sinned, we have a fallen human nature that has to be fixed. We can become what, like what Adam was, but we need to go beyond that. And in Augustine's terms, we need to move to the place where Christ is, and that is that we get to the position where we never sin. And this is what standing in the presence of God in heaven would be like. So, so I think Nevin has helped me think through that, that there's two realities which are taking place in human salvation. One is the healing grace that takes place where our, our fallenness, our sin is taken care of. The second is that we move beyond simply the humanity that Adam and Eve had. We are elevated to become the same kind of human being that Christ was in the incarnation. And uh, with this leads uh, a really interesting discussion of the concept of what's known as deification that we actually can be united with the divine in the same way that the human nature of Christ is united with the divine nature. Um, this is a long, complex discussion, but basically, 2 Peter 1, 4 um, talks about this reality that we share in the divine nature. And how do we do that? Because we'll never leave behind our creaturely status, so we don't become gods, but we become united to the divine nature in the same way that Christ's human nature did. It is through Christ's human nature that we have access to the divine nature. And it is only through this incarnational reality that we have this. That may be an interesting discussion for the Q&A time. Um, but that's, that's something that is being recovered in Reformed theology. Calvin taught a doctrine of deification. Edwards taught a doctrine of deification. Um, and so, it's, it's the question of what does really happen to us in heaven, right? Do we simply continue this existence, or are we in some way transformed? C.S. Lewis famously talked about the, uh, the idea that the union of the human and the divine is the next stage of human evolution, right? What now, Nevin does believe in evolution, or uh, excuse me, Lewis believes in evolution. That's a controversial aspect of Lewis's thought. But, right, but evolutionists are always asking what's next. For Lewis, the answer is that we become, that we have access to the divine nature in a way that we can't now as the human beings that we are. Right, so um, incarnation um, is a big thing that I think Nevin has helped me think through. Um, Doctrine of the Church. Um, I think the big thing with the Doctrine of the Church that uh, Nevin has helped, and I think Nevin's helped a lot of people, um, those, those who grew up in evangelical churches, I think, struggle um, at some point with the Doctrine of the Church that evangelicalism has, right? What is the church to evangelicals? Um, mostly, it is about the, the needs that we have as human beings in the sense of, of right, you, you, you don't know yourself completely, you need other human beings around you to help you see your faults so you can grow further in grace. Which is true, but 
you know, the men's theology forum can do that, right? We can live in fellowship and community with one another, and we can do that, but that doesn't mean that the men's theology forum of the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia is a church. <laughs> it's right? not. So, so Nevin, I think, really wants us to focus on uh, what helped me focus through and think through this idea, right? What is the church? Is it simply a bunch of us get together and say, hey, we're going to be a church, right? And I think Nevin wants to say, no, it, it can't be that, right? There has to be something more that's going on in, uh, in our doctrine of the church than simply that, right? And, and this is where he gets into his... The church has to have certain characteristics, it has to be visible, Catholic, it has to be holy, right? All of the stuff that we want to kind of throw into that discussion. Um, Nevin, I think, does want to remind us that church is something more than just a Bible study, right? Um, modern evangelicals, kids that I grew up going to church with, they leave the church behind. Why? Because they heard all through their lives the church wasn't needed for salvation, well, if I don't need it, what's the point? I'll sleep in on Sunday. And I think Nevin wants to say, whoa, 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 whoa. If, if the church is the continuation of the incarnational reality of Christ, the church has to be something more than just a Bible study. It has to be have these characteristics that we place our faith in that the church will bring us through um, to the completion that God intends for us, right? In Reformed terms, uh, we, we, we always believe that, that God uses means to bring about ends. And for Nevin, the church is the means that God, has used, that it, God is using to bring about the ends of human salvation. In my life, in the life of individuals, and in the life of all of humanity. Right? What is God doing? God is doing this work through his church. Now, right, I was talking with my mother about this. And, uh, you know, I grew up as a Baptist, and so immediately the Baptist asks, no, wait a minute. Does that mean that the person who lives in an area where there is no church, right, can be saved? No, right? The exceptions don't make good rules. Um, there's a reason we have the normal course of events. We keep, terms, keep things in these terms. Under normal circumstances, we should be united to a church because the church gives us the life that we need through the ministration of the sacraments that are found in the church, right? God, God is merciful. If someone is in an area where there is no church, God is not going to say, sorry, you're out of luck, right? The reality is, we, this is what we know about God. But under normal circumstances and normal situations, the reality is the people who leave the church behind don't do so because there's no church available. It's because there's no reason that they think to go to church. Right? So, so uh, means of grace are necessary for our lives. Uh, we talk in reform circles about the ordinary means of grace, right? Um, the sacraments, um, the preaching ministry of the church, right? Calvin talks about how can you tell a true church? It has two marks. It has the word preached and the sacraments properly ministered, right? So when you have these things, you have a church. But without these things, you don't have a church. So can you have a church without sacraments? Calvin would say no. Conversely, can you have a church without the preaching of the word? This is a problem with, with the Roman Catholic, right? Can you, for the Roman Catholics, it's all about the Eucharist. You can have the Eucharist and nothing else, and you've had church. Calvin would say no, 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 no. You have to have the preaching of the word. You have to have the administration of the sacraments. Um, so, so for me, Calvin has helped, or excuse me, uh, Nevin has helped me think through this reality of, all right, um, I am really dissatisfied with evangelicalism that is found in America because, right, they, they lack creeds, there's no sacraments, everything is all in their heads, right, and what is it? I don't even know, right, what is the modern evangelical church in America? I scratch my head sometimes, I don't get it. What are we? I don't know. Other than a set of moral principles. Nevin's helped me think through, well, all right, even, even if we take all of the bad, the church does, is necessary for us because it gives us this reality. So, right, um, so what is the church? Um, the church is necessary 
right? We really, truly do need to call the church our mother. It is the, it is the, the, the reality in which we are born, we are raised, we live, we marry, we have children, we die. This is the church. We're buried. This is the church. This is the life that uh, is, is part of it. And I think, for the most part, if you go back, even to the Puritans, as much as Nevin hates the Puritans, even to the Puritans, if you ask the Puritan what makes a Christian, the life of the church is the answer. It is not some conversion story or aisle that we walk, a prayer that we pray. It is the life of the church. You're baptized in the church. You're catechized in the church. You grow in the church. You marry in the church. Uh, you raise children in the church. You catechize these children in the church. This is this life. This is how Christians are formed. And so, for Nevin, I think he's helped me think through this reality. Nevin has helped me think through, although I think uh, my journey began with the doctrine of the sacraments more so than anything else, but Nevin has certainly helped me think through, I'll say it this way, Nevin's helped me read Calvin, Calvin's doctrine of the sacraments and understand what Calvin meant. So if that makes any sense. Calvin on the sacraments is sometimes really long, really deep, and you're like, wait, what? Nevin has helped me think this through. If you're wondering where, where do I get a good understanding of the doctrine of the sacraments, I would start with Nevin's mystical presence. He really helped me think through what is Calvin uh, trying to say there. So sacraments are real vehicles of grace which accomplish what they're intended to accomplish uh, in the life of a person who comes with faith to the table. Um, to the to the baptismal font, right? These things actually accomplish what it is that they are intended, not because of something we do, but because Christ has promised that these are the things that will bring us um, the salvation that He's promised. So uh, for Nevin, um, uh, what he wants to do in mystical presence is he wants to remind the Reformed Church of the Reformed doctrine of the sacraments and not this 19th century problem that uh, essentially the Reformed Church has taken on Zwinglianism and all we have is memorial, we don't have any real sacramental presence. So for Nevin, he really kind of focused my mind on, on sacraments. Um, I think uh, another thing Nevin has helped is he's really helped me understand um, and this is more germane to my academic work, uh, helped me see the Reformation in the new light. Um, particularly the Reformers. The Reformers are not attempting to start the church over. The Reformers are always claiming that we are a continuation of the church. We are not a new church, we are the church. In the same way that uh, we can always say that we were the church, right? So it's not a new thing, as opposed to the Anabaptists, the Anabaptists are starting a new thing. They're openly overt about starting a new thing. Uh, but the Reformers want to definitely say, we are not starting a new thing. We are continuing. We are a continuation of the church, as the church has always existed through time. This isn't new. We aren't required to be new. Um, Calvin, in his preface to the Institutes, talks about this idea, right? The Catholics are saying to the reformers, where are your miracles if you're starting a new church? Calvin says, we are starting a new church. We don't need to have miracles. We are the church the same way that the church has always been understood. We are new. We are the church. Just a continuation. Um, so, <clears throat> let me see. I think I had something else. Uh, yeah, I think I'll end there. Um, there's lots of things that I could look through and say uh, this is, these are things that Nevin has helped me understand. The big thing, though, that I think Nevin has done is he's given me a context outside of my own culture by which I can say, well, all right, I'm dissatisfied with where I'm at, but I don't know what all is the reason I'm dissatisfied. Nevin has helped me say, here's the, the problems, because these are the things that he sees prophetically are going to take place. So... Um, I find him interesting. Um, you know, my advisor told me if you're going to write your dissertation on something, uh, make sure it's interesting enough that it'll get you through the boring parts because everyone hates the person they write about by the time they're done. Um, and so far, I don't hate him, but I can understand what he meant because you're just so buried in the thought of the person. 
Um, but I do find him interesting. He's not uncritiquable. I think there are things you want to look at and say, well, he doesn't quite, you know, we want to critique what he has to say, but I just find him interesting. So um, am I a Nevin guy? Not necessarily. I just think he has some interesting things to say, which we need to hear. And so that's, thank you very much.